hey, we're down home. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Encouraging Your Spirit, the podcast. I am your host, Chris Wiley, and we are so excited tonight to have a guest for our Faith Conversation series. Faith Conversation is about how life intersects uh, ministry and faith, and we are so excited and delighted to have our guest, Liam M. Hooper, who has a master's in divinity, is an author, gender theorist, a theological uh, activist, a trans advocate, an educator, a podcaster, a public speaker, and freelance content writer. He is also a 2020 to 2022 cohort fellow of the William C. Friday Fellowship for Human Relations and was a community nominated participant in the Winston-Salem Portrait Project. Liam works widely as a speaker and a participant co-creator of learning community communities, workshops, and seminars, small and large. On occasion, Liam's spouse, Diana, and Dodie, the family dog, travel with him, especially when doing this work involves going to a new and interesting place. Thank you so much for being our guest tonight. So we're going to get started with icebreaker questions and word associations. So if you had a superpower, what would yours be? Oh, that's a tough question. I think, okay. I think if I, I think if I had a, I know it's supposed to be a simple question, but um, it's fine. So I'm torn between two responses, right? One okay. response would be, I would have the, the same superpower as my childhood hero, Batman, which okay. is, and I think I have one of those, which is the okay. ability to transform my fears into my power. Right. Okay. Awesome. But at the same time, I feel like if I had a superpower, it would be my willingness to give it away to somebody who needed it worse than me. Okay. That is awesome. <laughs> that makes sense. That does. That that does. That makes so much sense. So if I say word associations, if I say life, what word comes to your mind? Like I'm. <laughs> be okay. Beyond um. Beyond the the Jewish Jewish association with with Lachaim to life, mm -hmm. um, life I th I think at this point makes me think about um, the gift of it. Okay. okay. And the and the need to not take it for granted. It's um, mm -hmm. probably in some ways nothing less than a miracle that I'm still here. So okay. I you know I try to try to be grateful for that. Okay. Okay. Ministry. Ah. Uh, that word has changed a lot okay. <laughs> for me. I, okay. yeah. I think at this point, I think ministry is something every human being does with other human beings mm -hmm. when they're engaged together in the process of being in relationship. Okay. Okay. If I said hope, what would you say? The thing that gets me out of bed every day. Okay. And if I said faith? What would you say? So on one level, I would say faith is the thing that keeps all of us moving and getting out of bed every day, right? Like that we mm -hmm. people who continue to be here in the midst of like challenges and strife and, you know, big issues like trauma or, you know, illness, tragedy, believe in something, right? Mm -hmm. That there's something that that keeps us trying to figure out what it means to maybe go forward or to make mm -hmm. it still not feel um, futile or, right. or wasted, right? And then, and then on another level, um, faith for me is the belief that um, there is some force presence that we commonly call God. Mm-hmm. And that the human, um, the human search for that mm -hmm. can be um, sort of manifest or expressed in our desire to keep trying to figure out how to be on a planet with other human beings and mm -hmm. feel good about that. Right? Okay. Like, that makes sense. Completely makes sense. So I came across your work uh, in the Queer Theology Facebook group. 
that was talking about your your book uh and the book is transforming proclamation a transgender theology of daring existence and how it came about in the conversation was i think it's uh one the the founder or the creator of the group sometimes people are always looking for books to read on any particular area and so there somebody had said in the post what's a good book to read and they listed your book along with, uh, I think it's Kittridge Cherry, and I'm hoping I'm getting her name, is the founder of that group. Yes, and she yes. has a, 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 a newsletter and yes. so on, on amazing topics. But she also puts uh, different books on all kinds of topics in theology, whether it's faith or just life experiences or whatever. And so that's how they were talking about the book. So for those listeners who will hear this podcast who are not necessarily in the Facebook group and have not heard about the book, can you share a little bit about yourself with our listeners? Um, yeah, I think I can mm -hmm. do that. I never quite know where to begin with with that particular question. <laughs> but, um, so, so, so Kitteridge, yes, it has mm -hmm. an amazing history, too, mm -hmm. in terms of um, the sort of LGBTQ history in this country kind of writ large, you know, and mm -hmm. comes from a lot of things. And it was a really exciting moment for me when I made it to the to her list of the top 25 yeah. books about you know religion mm -hmm. and theology and lgbtqness to to coin a term um mm -hmm. so i think i am um i am a person who am, who had experiences with um being queer mm -hmm. and being trans okay early enough in um my life Mm -hmm. And early enough in the history of the United States, and, okay. and our common, you know, our shared history. Shared like, history. Okay. I was born in '63. So, okay. Um. Um, you know, pushing sixty with some earnestness at this okay. point. But, so <laughs> when I was when I was growing up and began talking about and thinking about, you know, why don't I look like the other boys? Mm hmm. Why, when am I gonna, you know, when am, when am I gonna be like a, a regular boy? Mm -hmm. That was concerning to my parents in our sort of um, post Leave It to Beaver, you know, society. And right. Um, at the time, psychiatry in this country and um, sort of the psychological approach to therapy or psychotherapy was still very, very conservative. Mm -hmm. And, um, so my interact, my parents took me to, to, you know, my parents tried to help me, which good parents would do. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty much a disaster. Okay. So the, the reason I say this or tell you this is it gives you some framework for um, a lot of my perspective, right? Because at the tender age of like six, mm -hmm. I don't really remember, they gave me some pretty powerful medication. Okay. And um, it messed with the parts of my head that um, you need to be able to process memory and retain memory and recall memory. And um, that is really important when, you know, you're also trying to figure out who you are, mm -hmm. right? The medication also sort of chemically dissociated me. Oh. So that my body just learned how to do that. So when they took the medication away, Mm -hmm. You know, I was still kind of um, what what we might refer to as really high functioning, dissociated almost all the time, and with okay. a lot of difficulty with memory. Mm -hmm. So when someone asks me, "Well, you know, sort of who are you?" or "Tell us about yourself," I'm. It sort of leads me to sort of a queer lens about. Um, I mean, I mean that in the theoretical sense, you know, all the okay. things that queerness can be sort of a queer lens with what it means to be a person, mm -hmm. what it means to participate in the construction of our personhood, right? right? And then to try to interact in a world that either adequately or not reflects back to us mm -hmm. that sense of self that we're both sort of already here with and yet... Mm -hmm constructing 
and um, interacting with the world in such a way that that shapes and forms us. And so all of my experience and mm -hmm. all of sort of who I am and what there is about me is filled with this enormous curiosity and fascination okay. with what it means to be a human being. What it means to be a human being. Okay. Okay. And the title of, which leads me to my next question, which the title of your book um, is inspiring to me because I guess I think about like two things, three things I think about. Transforming, because on the podcast for a while, I've been talking about uh, transformation in terms of life, in terms of, of scripture, and then, you know, just the, the daring existence part speaks to me. Uh, and just in title, and maybe too, is partly because in my uh, studies in information science, I'm always interested in um, metaphors and yeah. hermeneutical thought yes. and like what, how you can draw context and cultural context in, in different things. So when I think of like daring existence, well, I also think about, you know, I was thinking today when I was um, just, you know, in my own prayer time and just thinking about their upcoming conversation, I was thinking about this, this, the uh, Hebrews 11, 1, that, you know, now faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. I was thinking about that in context of daring existence because I felt like not just in scripture or biblical characters, but in life, I feel like, you know, many of us are creating an existence that did not exist before or walking and moving and acting in spaces, uh, whether that's socially, whether that's historically, whether that's in, if, if you think about like academics, sometimes scholarly, especially when I think about like scholars that are studying race, gender and sexuality or scholars that are talking about history uh, or information science or science in itself. You're right. often, you know, talking about a world or politically, we can throw the political science and communication people in there too. Uh, you're talking about a world that it doesn't necessarily exist today in 2022 or at least there are parts of it that you're thinking about that might not exist some parts might and so i was just wondering like how did you come up with the title of the book and what were you thinking about when you came well, up with it so primarily i was making some puns mm -hmm. you know in terms of transforming literally transforming what we mean when we think of proclamation like mm -hmm. what what is that Right. But, you know, on another level, I was thinking about um, themes in the book that deal with spiritual life as a transformative process. Right. right? Okay. And that becoming a self is both simultaneously always doing this dance between formation and transformation. Right. Mm -hmm. That we're always as much as we don't like to talk about this, we're always mm -hmm. this self we come into the world with and this mm -hmm. self that is unfolding. Right. Which right, we right. are also always mm -hmm. becoming more deeply aware of or mm -hmm. not in some cases, right? Mm -hmm. Or we're not allowed to express our full awareness of that self right. because of these right. kind of systems that you're talking about, right? Right. And so I'm playing... Um, in the title with language in the same way that I do throughout the whole book, right? Mm -hmm. Like I do not make assumptions that most academic literature makes. Like if I were to use a word like capitalism, which I don't, I talk about what capitalism is, yes. okay. I describe it, but I don't use those terms on purpose mm -hmm. because we have this set of assumptions. We know what they mean, right? And it's the same way we have this set of assumptions that we know what it means to be a human being. Right. 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 And those assumptions very often prevent us from understanding one another because they're at odds, mm -hmm. right? They're false assumptions. Right. And I'm trying to pull us away from the sort of unconscious way of operating with language and our own thought processes that have been kind of um, thrust upon us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they become quasi-conscious, right? Like we're choosing right. to use the word, but we're unconsciously making assumptions about what we're talking about. So I'm trying to transform language. I'm trying to speak to how becoming a self is a transformative and formative process all the time. It's like, um, like, a, what is it? A Mobius strip, right? Right. Right. And faith, mm -hmm. believing in something, Mm -hmm. that keeps us going is also transformative. Right. And then I'm talking about a proclamation. 
Mm -hmm. a living, breathing, I'm still here proclamation that aims to transform how we live and move and have our being together to, to quote right. one of your texts from Acts, right? Like, so um, <laughs> to, to think about right. transforming how we are in relationship with one another and how we construct communities and, you know, leading us to then maybe have discussions around what communal care really means, what healing means, what becoming a self unfettered by oppression and restriction might right. mean. Right, that's a great point. Hold that because I, okay. well, I, I my next question was about community. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yet my other question is when you were talking about like the evolution of, of self and just because uh, I was thinking the thing that came to mind about is how people say sometimes there's our actual self, there's our perceived self, there's our projected self. And I was thinking about how that is, is relative to the transformation process mm -hmm. possibly. And then I was also thinking about, I think it was a devotional I was reading the other week on the United Church of Christ, I think is Pastor Doza is her name. And she was talking about uh, like she had this this whole story about a belief that she wasn't good at math. Right. And yeah, right. And you're, you're yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was so good because I was like, that is so true. Cause it was like the scripts that we run about our life. But yes. later she was like, you know, when she needed to know, uh, I think it was regression analysis, the math in itself became symbols and words and she figured it out. And she was saying that could it possibly be that we have uh, scripts that we're running about ourselves, whether you're bad at relationships or you're bad at finances or you're bad at whatever it is. Maybe it's not bad, but maybe it's something like that. And I was just thinking about how for me it brought up that one more than one thing can be true at the same time. And it can be true that sometimes we might not be good at it now, but it isn't finite. And I know sometimes uh, in conversation uh, with my wife, I get we talk about how like sometimes she'll make statements and I will, you know, have a whole internalized conversation about what she says. And I know people do this. It's not just marital people uh, or however you identify, you, whoever says that you have this, this conversation of what you think they said versus what they actually said. Or the issue where you where they said X and you make I make that definitive for every single thing when it's like that's really not what they meant. They just meant in relationship to what it is that they talk what they were talking about. And I was thinking, people, we do that in terms yes. of what you know who we say we are or how sometimes who I was at this point in my life that was true then. But that's not necessarily true now. And I think about how, well, maybe when we're talking about evolution, it's this expansive level of consciousness that is continuing to happen. So we're yes. transforming because who I was at 22 is not necessarily the same Chris that now sits with you at 45, which I would hope is true for anybody for a lot of different reasons. And sometimes it's not. And that's OK, too. So yes. just hold his face. We are. Us. Right, we're where you are, you know? And yeah. I was just thinking about that. I, I really appreciate um, where you're going with that because I think at the heart of, you know, my work, you know, whether I'm speaking with um, a particular religious group or a civic group or, um, you know, writing or creating learning environment anywhere, one of the, the core things I talk about is multiplicity right mm -hmm. like both you know in terms of intersectional awarenesses of right power and what's happening in the world and who mm -hmm. people are and how communities for right like there's a whole lot of stuff going on just with trying to be in a world with other human beings right, right. and when we start talking about power dynamics right there's mm -hmm. a multiplicity of things going on there too right and mm -hmm. the self is like um in my mind more and more, I think this is true for how I think mm -hmm. about it. The self is like this kaleidoscopic thing that mm -hmm. is at once unified, right? Mm -hmm. I am myself. I am not me and you and you know, right. and other people, right? right. Yeah. I am myself. But depending on what's acting on me, right? Like what's turning the wheels and what mm -hmm. decisions I'm making about um, how I'm going to look through my own lens at myself and the world and people around me, the, the color shift and the mosaic shifts, it's still mm -hmm. a self. Right. 
but it's in this constant unfolding that sometimes surprises us, which yeah. I think is fabulous, right? Like, right. I think that is, you know, a holy and sacred experience. Right. You know, in my worldview, that's how I think about God in the universe and us in it. That is that is miraculous, right? Yeah. To be surprised yeah. by who we are and right. to realize that the same person truly, you know, the Buddhists were right about this. Mm -hmm. The same person never steps twice in the same stream. It's mm -hmm. not the same water. No. And we are not who we were 10 minutes ago. We weren't. We are not. And being Even okay. Though we are. Them. Right. Even like though we are right. Self is in here. Right. And one of the ways that um, I teach about this, I'm interested in your thoughts about this, actually, because um, I'm enjoying our conversation. Um, Thank you. You know, I usually people interview you and you, you just answer a question. Yeah. It doesn't really feel like a conversation. So I'm right. really appreciating this. One of the ways I teach this is um, how I talk about how we use language as um, trans or what I refer to as gender transcendent people, which includes everybody. Right. right. Okay. Non binary okay. folks, intersex folks. Right. Okay. All kind of, I mean, when I say gender transcendent, I'm meaning people who are not cisgender. Right. Got it. Okay. Totally understand. That's the simplest way. And how we use language about ourselves and respond to how language is used about us, toward us, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes works from those same assumptions we were talking about in a really mm -hmm. negative way, like the term dead naming, for example. Right. I get that on one level and on another level, it troubles me because mm -hmm. I think it leads that kind of dichotomous selfhood mm -hmm. leads us to think that our old self isn't here. Right. That there is an old self that is somehow separate from us. Whereas we're always carrying with us the old self, the now self and the self to be right. Like that's all, that's all here all the time. All and the I would not have survived. Mm -hmm. And I know many of my peers would not have, mm -hmm. were it not for the child self mm -hmm. that believed in something, right. that hoped for something enough to kick my ass out of the bed every day. Right. And help me figure out how to keep going. And so why I get a little crazy if people call me Lisa. Mm hmm I love her. Right. He is me. Yeah. I am her. Right. And the person that I had to be to fulfill everybody's idea of who Lisa was and to survive, right? To not get mm -hmm. dead in some way is very much a part of who I am now and who I will be in the future. The same right. as this now, this mm -hmm. Liam who has trouble envisioning Lisa anymore. Right. Right. And I get, I, totally, I totally get that because in two ways, one, I, 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 my given name is Christy. That's what my parents name. My mother would tell you she named me Christy because she was going through this period where she had, you know, found God or found the Lord and she wanted people to write Christ over and over again. Christy means, you know, follower of a follower of Christ. Fine. Right. Cool. Okay. But, you know, I don't, you know, personally, if you ask me now, because it's been new to me over the last couple of years of really walking out and really understanding my identity, because I spent probably about 20 some years identifying as a masculine of center lesbian only to realize that really doesn't fit. I have zero connection to femininity. But I and I understand it. I totally do because I often feel like while that's true, it's also feel like I feel like I'm really trying to figure out what masculinity looks like for me mm -hmm. because and, and a lot of things of what people ascribe to, I don't necessarily ascribe to. I'm not necessarily seeking to take you know testosterone. Shout out to people who do. But there are a lot of things that people in different communities say you got to do this, and they have this whole list of it's only mm -hmm. these things that you can do, or that brings up you know the dead name. And I'm like, I there are publications as a librarian that are that say Christy, and I don't have a problem with that. Now I just learned, hey, you can tell the publisher how you want to be referred. I didn't know that till two years, till, till within this last year. It's fine, but I honor that experience. And I realize, like, as you're saying, the experiences of living as Christy made Chris and are making the person that I seek to be when I think of, like, when you get to whatever fully arrived is. And I think 
Christopher. That's that's where I'm going. And oftentimes it is a space that does not exist that I'm figuring it out. And then the other part mm -hmm. is um, I'm in this trans cohort group. We literally started, you know, probably a, a little while ago, and it's just kept going. With Freedom Center? Yes. As a Michael, uh, maybe it's Freedom Center, but Michael Battle, Peace Garden is the name of it. Do you, I don't know if you know him, but he, he's no. the person. No, so that might not be it. Be it. But um, it's uh, uh, Michael Battle is uh, one of the, the, the founder of that group. And so we've been just talking, just having conversations and building community with each other. And somebody was just asking about, you know, what people thought about detransitioning. I don't know if it was their experience, the person that brought it up, but, you know, I just thought about how, you know, people have varied um, perspectives on detransitioning. De and some people were saying in the group that they thought it related to somebody lacking support. And I know they're different, different people it that may, believe that. For some it, may, it may, you know, and I think too, when we think about like what trans, I, it just made me think about what transition means and how being open to all of the expansiveness of, of what, what that means. For some people, that'll involve a lot of moving parts. For some people, it might not be as many parts, but you get to choose. You get to decide who it is that you want to be and what fits and what works. And it will be a better world if we respect and honoring that. So if, yes. if it changes tomorrow, just let me know what you want me to do. Exactly. <laughs> And that's we yes. good. That's I don't have to understand. I don't have to agree. And it's not really about me needing to agree because you're living in the experience. There might be only parts that really affect and impact me. But regardless if it does or does not, still honor and respect people. I don't understand why that's difficult. <laughs> really, I, I really well, I do. I talk a lot about this in the book, you know, and about fear of difference and how we're mm -hmm. we're just from the minute we pop out and inner culture. Mm -hmm. we're being conditioned right, right. We're, we're absorbing all of these assumptions mm -hmm. and all of these prescribed ways of being right. right and we're also creating them we're participating in that right like we're not mm -hmm. just passive leaves on the stream right right at the same time i think the point that you're making so i want to first say i understand the term dead name works for people to mm -hmm. me, it just feels like bad energy, right? Like right. it okay. feels like murdering myself in some way or some part right. of myself that is right. still here. And that's right. just for me. Yeah, right, right, right. But I think you're you're pointing to something that is about the reasons why all of us who have been doing this work around, um, you know, sort of the theological activism around gender transcendence and around queerness and around all manner of things like race and um, class and caste mm -hmm. and right yeah. ability, all yeah. those things cause us to become more expansive, not more restrictive and to right. stop doing what Audre Lorde was talking about in 1979 when she said, we can never dismantle the master's house using the master's, master's tools, tools right like we have to keep shedding assumptions right and shedding beliefs and getting to know getting in contact with who we are and what our experience is in the world so that we can do the same with others right, right? like right. when so an example would be when people talk about we need to get to a genderless society i go wait why would we do that yeah there are people who are women mm -hmm. and there are people who are men and it's just as important to them as my quirky way of being a dude is important to me right yeah. like they have the right to be mm -hmm. the you right know, to exist all need yes. to figure out how to embrace the miraculousness of creation which is rooted in embracing the miraculousness of diversity person to person species to species planet to planet right mm -hmm. like it works this way because it's supposed to, to supposed to yeah yeah i totally right? we're not all supposed to be the same right. so why would if i don't want someone to prescribe to me how i get to be a person right why or how i, I even get to understand my own selfhood why mm -hmm. would i do that for you right 
Yeah. Now, I'm really interested in your thoughts about this because what that means is, <laughs> the, I think part of the reason that freaks out oppressed communities so bad, right, mm -hmm. is because it means being willing to be in some kind of contact, communication, or relationship with people who aren't like us and maybe aren't real crazy about the fact that we're here because they don't understand us. That is a that is an amazing point because the, what stands out in my mind is it was probably about a month ago I was listening to a, they had this panel of uh, black studies information science and these are uh, all kinds of uh, different people from different places it was four people and Andre Brock uh, Professor Brock was saying because uh, we were talking about blackness and they were talking about homophobia and his mm. comment was we cannot extract the parts that we don't like. And that has stuck with me yes. so long. And when you said it, because it's like when you talk about being in contact with people who who really don't see you as a as the right to exist, that is a challenge. And it also brings yes. up like in class and communication, we're talking about uh, dialectical, uh, the framework of, 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 of uh, the dialectic if you will, right. and about how this attention field conversation is built on assumptions, it's built on uh, intricacies, or they were using an example of like, the example for the, the framework they were using uh, last week was um, Alzheimer's patients, and about how oh, yeah. uh, the, the, they interviewed wives, where the husband is physically present, but in cognitively, not so much. Now, this was a study in what early 2000s. But since then, I just for curiosity sake, I've seen how people have, have used that same framework to look at all kinds of relationships mm -hmm. that exhibit that same type of presence versus lack of presence. Parts of you are here, parts of you are not. Or there are things that you don't like about a situation in an indoor experience and i that that to me often is a challenge when especially when you think about that in, in terms of academia or just in community of, of discourse in conversation yeah. you are gonna meet people that what they think when they say it out loud you're just gonna say you know what i'm gonna go on home tonight because <laughs> wait i'm about to come back i'm gonna come back i'm gonna come back to that or how do you stay in it to really just listen to what it is they're saying and not necessarily with the level of emo your emotions are fine, but I mean, it might be be a bit uh, cinched. And so being able to sit through that and figure out, okay, well, is there community here? Is that, and is that what we're seeking to build? Or is it that you just don't want me to exist, period, and you're not even open to any level of, I don't want to say compromise, but any level yeah. of interaction because how do we coexist together is that and i think oftentimes when we're talking about a lot of conversations and we look about like what does liberation look like or what does uh you know those areas you you would have to answer what is the goal what is it that you're right. trying to, to to seek and i think for a lot of us that answer is varied and I loved an article, and I can't remember the name of the author that I was reading today from my paper, because I just stumbled across it. But she was talking about in the Times article, it really doesn't matter who's who suffered more. That that's really not the issue. Right. You suffered, I've suffered. I don't have to see your suffering to know that you suffered. The real question though is what does collective lo uh, liberation look like for all of us? Yes. And I'm like, that that is what it is that we're really trying to say, or sh that's the deeper question, you know, yes. for your community, yes. for your group, <laughs> for you as a person, how does that look? And how does that look in cohesion with others? <laughs> because yes. there are others who do not have your experience, who do not have your agency, who do not have that, and are not interested. And it ain't really about that. It's, <laughs> but how do you still do it, even if those yeah. parts are not there? So which these are like, how do we yeah, work together? Mm -hmm. to create a situation where we're all liberated, right? Like right. when people are talking to me about liberty, somebody asked me once why I don't use the word freedom, why I use the word liberation all the time. Mm -hmm. And I said, because I was born free, right? <laughs> but I'm not yet liberated to freely be a self mm -hmm. and nor are others. Mm -hmm. And my liberation is bound up in yours and in the liberation of people who were more restricted 
and more yeah, oppressed yeah. than me. It is, it is interconnected. If we liberate them, mm-hmm. this is what, there's always such a misunderstanding sometimes about what we're talking about when we talk about centering the most vulnerable and adopting that viewpoint, that perspective. Mm-hmm. What does it look like from the margins of the margins mm-hmm. to turn around and look back, right? right. At the right. world. Well, right. if we center that viewpoint, if the most vulnerable and the most deprived and the most, you know, degraded are mm-hmm. lifted up, then by virtue of that, all of us are. Right. And that and all of us are lifted yeah, up. Right. I and get that's- to be the kind of man that I understand and am trying to work out that is right. not the maleness I was fed as a child, right? Mm-hmm. Not that toxic masculinity that I initially imprinted on, right. but something else. Mm-hmm. Then that dude down the street with the gun rack in his car gets the right to be the maleness he understands. Right, he does, right. And right. if we take care of the least, um, the least, well, the most vulnerable, Mm-hmm. We've taken care of those people too. Yeah. And yeah. we must care for them. This is one of the things I love about Judaism. And then I'll shut up and you <laughs> can say the next thing. I see it. I see it forming, right? Is Judaism calls us like it's a mitzvah. It's, it's what we're called to do mm-hmm. because it's how we love God is by doing things, not by believing, mm-hmm. right? Is to remember that we were once strangers. Mm -hmm. and slaves Mm -hmm. and to not do to others what we do not want done to ourselves right if i don't want people telling me how i can be a person as long as i'm harming no one right then i can't expect everybody else to be like me right does right. that make sense? I'm, I'm probably yeah, gonna yeah, it does. It does make sense. I really I'm think that being... I like I like the thought process in that because it's late in the day and I may <laughs> not be forming it well, but um, it, yeah. I think you get where I'm going, right? Like, yeah. the way we achieve justice is by extending to others what we believe justice to be. Now, that right. does not mean that I make myself a doormat, right? That does not mean that I set myself up for abuse. My extension of relationality to seek understanding doesn't give you the right to beat me about the head, right? So right. I'm going to leave if that if that be the case, right? Right, right, right. I can accept you. Uh, I can accept another person without mm-hmm. accepting their intent to do harm to me, okay. and I can call out their attempt to do harm to me or others, and still accept them as a person. It's not easy, no. But I think I have to do that if I want people to do that with me. Right. But I think the challenge in that becomes what does redress look like when they have harmed? Yes. Because, and I don't think that we ever have conversations about what no, that is. No, we don't. We, we don't. Just, we, we, and I think oftentimes there's this idea that people say, you forgive. And I'm like, but forgiveness, yes, I understand the concept of forgiveness, but forgiveness is not necessarily... Uh, always connected to reconciliation of relationships. And I know it's, it's not. because I'm and like, why would you not. reconcile a relationship that was harmful, that was toxic, that was abusive, that was violent? You can't necessarily, you're not you can't, you aren't able to reconcile those relationships. No. This so it's like, okay, you, you can that. forget, maybe, you know, and I don't know necessarily if forget if forgiveness is achieved, or maybe being expansive to understand it really depends on the subject, it really depends on the context, and it really depends on the situation. And and, and oftentimes, and that's because I know there's a podcast somewhere where I'm talking about repairing fractured relationships, and I'm like, sometimes we're gonna need a therapist and law enforcement, and we're gonna have to figure out all these parts because it's not like I'm ever saying. Yes, go forgive them and get them a hug. And y'all, that's not what we say. <laughs> that it's it, it right. depends on the situation. It really does. And I think about that though in terms of like accepting other people. And you know, and I think too when I think about accepting other people, we have to uh, hold space and be honest that sometimes people are both uh, the victim and the villain. 
It's yes. in, a, in a complexity that pe more than one thing can be true at the same time. And I think about that too in terms of my own personal life, that sometimes when I look at my relational experiences, the disdain that others have for me, you know, when they have that, that's based on the Chris that I was at that time. It's not necessarily true now, but my some of my behavior was toxic. It wasn't, you know, to the level of um, violence or harm or committing a crime, right. but that's not the point. They were still harmed. So, you know, I can say yes, and I have said in some of those situations, I'm sorry, I apologize. And in some cases, they were able to forgive, forgive, or I don't even know what happened because we don't necessarily have the relationship of any kind anymore. But I think in terms of people, you know, it's true. People are both. It just it just depends. And then that's to me is like, well, what does redress look like in that situation? What does app? Because, you know, it oftentimes when we're talking about social justice, people are like, that's why we should have abolition. And I'm like, but everybody doesn't understand what abolition is or what abolition, abolition looks like. And when you're saying, you know, even when you're talking about Jesus, you know, there there's several different representations of Jesus in the Bible. So people love Luke Jesus, but Paul wasn't writing about the same Jesus that Luke was. That's, that's and people well, gravitate well. towards the, the Jesus that speaks to them, and that's fine. But you have all of that living around us, and 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 all of that level of interpretation. And I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm just saying that's a part of the whole faith life experience. In, in well, and the multiplicity of yes. there, there are multiple humans. Right, right, right. We make we make jokes in Judaism about um, if you have um, three Jews talking about a text or some other thing, you have 15 opinions. <laughs> right. And so that's one of the, I, I say that laughingly, right? As a, mm -hmm. But there's a fundamental difference mm -hmm. in mindset, right? Like mm -hmm. Judaism is based on contending with God. Look at Moses, look at Abraham, look at, right? Mm -hmm. Like that we have all these models mm -hmm. Of, of saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't understand, help me understand, or mm -hmm. why, what are you doing? Because God is bigger than what we understand, what we can right. fathom. And yeah. all that we're ever dealing with is our perception of who we think God might be based upon our experience. Mm -hmm. And none of that is ever the totality of God, much less the totality of Jesus or any other human mm -hmm. being, right? True. All these things multiplicities mm -hmm. this kaleidoscope of selfness and and cosmos and earth and squirrels and right like all the squirrels aren't one squirrel mm -hmm. right right all the robins are not one <laughs> robin, robin right? right like mm -hmm. and why would we expect human beings to be the same right we can my book i talk about like platypuses and um baobab trees and mm -hmm. all kinds of other things to say we say tree what do we mean what do we mean right, right. and all of them are trees, mm -hmm. right? Human beings are the same way. And I was saying this for, a re oh, so <laughs> I really, really appreciate your point about all these things being true at the same time and how harm doers mm -hmm. are often operating from their own trauma their own internalized assumptions or their own internalized tapes and messages about themselves and the world from harm that was done them. What we do know is that it's not just goodness and kindness that's self-perpetuating. Mm -hmm. Harm is self-perpetuating. Mm -hmm. It gives birth to itself like bunnies, mm -hmm. right? And in, in, it may in some ways be more prolific than kindness, mm -hmm. right? right? But I do believe that kindness is, is um, self-propagating. Right. right, right. You know, if I smile at you, odds are good you're going to smile back, right? Right, right. And if I look at you like I'm looking for a fight, I've given you code to expect one. Right, 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 right. Right, and I think, I think that's what one of the most challenging points about trying to do transformational work with other mm -hmm. human beings, if you're a member of an oppressed group or a marginalized mm -hmm. group, is because it's really troubling to look at the ways a person can be both victim and victimizer. 
that a person can be both loving and hate filled. It is. Chat, it's, it's, it's example, then this just came to me. I was in a research fellowship experience this past summer, May through, uh, May through December. And so they were training us on different tools, software tools, thinking about information science, kind of like an overview of, pos you know, giving you a toolkit as you go to your institution virtually and do this work. Here's some things you can add to your toolkit to possibly try in whatever research project you're going to do. So one of the researchers is presenting this tool called Open Refine. It's a tool that lets you, you know, go through data, you know, how whatever data you use qualitative, meaning text and words, or you can, you know, use it, you know, quantitatively, meaning mathematically, totally fine. This particular researcher is highlighting the international, uh, this project that was based on uh, the history of the slave trade in Maryland. Well, mm -hmm. That as a as a librarian and an and a informationist, I understand records of slavery exist. Slavery happened. As a black person, I understand that being a, de a descendant of the enslaved, totally understand. He's talking about his research project. This is a research environment. There's all kinds of research going on. That's not, that's never the issue. One of the uh, other faculty members, because these are faculty members at various institutions, he's showing you know these records. These are records of enslaved people. No longer here, never consented, can't speak for themselves. That And one of the... Um, uh, faculty members is saying, oh, the data is just so rich. I'm like, I don't know if that's an appropriate thing to say, considering positionality, <laughs> Ouch. She's a white female Jew. So, because in speaking of Jewish people, you would not say that about the research that they do about the Holocaust, the Holocaust or the Nazi experiments. Matter of fact, when you read anything before they before you even get to the data or the information or the text, they tell you from the gate, if you aren't using ethics of care, you are a heretic. And 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 they, they have a whole list of negative connotations about people before you even get to whatever it is the reason why you're yes. looking at it. But yet for other communities, they don't show that same level of care. And I often find that, you know, problematic when we're talking yes. about victims, people that have been oppressed, people that have experienced genocide, people that have experienced murder, people that have experienced. And it's not just whether it was 400 years ago in slavery, but how that translates in everyday life when we say Black Lives Matter. It isn't that we're saying it isn't that we're not saying that white lives don't matter. It's just black life. You, you can't you can't get Skittles. You can't get stopped. You can't. It's just a list of you can't yes. just exist. It's the same argument that at the same time, when you look at the struggle of Palestine that, and, and Israel and the relationship of of special with the with the United States, giving you know the government the government of the United States said that Israel has a special relationship, much like um, uh, the United Kingdom. But the point is, you know, Palestinians, Palestinians, and Israel's have been arguing over that area since years, multiple years, and it is the argument of the right to exist, which is the same thing we're saying about the right to exist. The underlying argument to me is the, the same argument of right to exist as LGBTQIAS, the right to exist as uh, Palestinian, the right to exist as Black, the right to exist as, as Jewish, the right to exist. Now, they yes, might not necessarily be coming for Jewish people in the same context of a Holocaust, but violence to various groups of people happens every day in Syria, in Ethiopia, in Uganda, in all of these every countries day. every day. And so, which leads me to my question of how are you handling, you know, community with others when you have people that these experiences are real and forgiveness is not necessarily, I forgive you for murdering my entire family. I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to those big questions. <laughs> so, I don't either. Right. I don't either. I, you know, I do suspect though that on some level, like particularly in a very personal example, you know, my parents mm -hmm. did me harm, not on purpose. Mm -hmm. the, the psychiatrist who treated me harmed me. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, you know, I've spent my whole adult life, well, my entire life unpacking that shit and trying to make sense right. out of it, you know, right. to be quite honest and to figure out how to be a person when I was starting, literally starting over mm -hmm. every day. Right. You know, I, do I forgive them? Of course. Right. They did not intend me harm. So mm -hmm. like there's, intent matters and we don't like to talk about that either right because mm -hmm. we're just we want to just talk about well intent doesn't you know equate to impact impact can be yes that's true but intent should mitigate some things right it should give us a place to start having conversation mm -hmm. it should give us a place to start trying to understand one another right. until there's real harm like right. i mean malicious harm on mm -hmm. purpose mm -hmm. i don't know that we forgive that right and i also don't know that forgiveness changes the truth of a thing mm -hmm. it, and it's certainly by no means meant to erase it right right like if if you do me if i do you harm and you forgive me it doesn't mean i didn't harm you right and that you don't have to deal with healing that and if you're allowing me and i'm willing that i don't have to participate in that right like there's still that right, right. amends there's making and as mm -hmm. a recovering person mm -hmm. amends has a lot of value with me right mm -hmm. like i'm i'm fascinated by that and i'm interested in it and i'm curious about how it functions and works and what it looks like and a multiplicity of situations right and right. how we navigate that and mm -hmm. the thing i do believe i don't know much of anything but one mm -hmm. thing i do know or i i do believe is that the answers to these big questions exist in the very the very things that make it all complex and challenging right which is our ability to try to keep figuring out how to be a self living mm -hmm. in the world with other people trying to be a self. Yes. I really believe that there is that that the answer is in those spaces and places, however they exist. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly with you. I am also aware sometimes it's all we can do to sit in them and sometimes we have to get up and leave. Right, right, right. And maybe come back another day or never go back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn most when writing your book? Mm. That's some deep stuff right there. First of all, I would do it completely differently today. Two mm -hmm. days after it hit the hit the market, I would have done it completely differently. You know, okay. stream okay. person again, mm -hmm. right? Okay. But I think what I learned was the deep degree to which I internalized the most harmful messages I got as a child Interacting mm -hmm. with the mental health system. Okay. And that I'm always going to be healing that. Despite, you know, okay. the 30 some years of recovery that I have and the work that right. I've done and the progress that I've made, mm -hmm. the book revealed to me how much I still devalue. Um, I default to devaluing myself and my own capabilities and my own thoughts and mm -hmm. my own experience, my own scholarship or, be, mm -hmm. you know, like I really work with that every day. Right. Most of it unconscious and the book made me consciously aware of that. Okay. Okay. When we look at our world today and the legislation that affects trans lives, what would you what would be something you would say to encourage and uplift others? Oh. Okay, I'm trying not to get misty. That I'm okay, sorry. so no, it's fine, it's fine. Okay. I appreciate the question. I just, you know, it these are dark days. Mm -hmm. There is no getting around that. Mm-hmm. As a person who lived through dark times, I mean, the times where we were still, where medical son, I don't want to say we, where human beings in this country with the power to do so were still mutilating intersex babies and were, you know, 
hooking gay men up to electrodes and giving them mm -hmm. a version. I mean, like yeah. someone who lived through that, mm -hmm. through the AIDS epidemic or mm -hmm. the first waves of that, which it's a okay. miracle I'm still alive, and lived through, you know, a pretty devastating, I mean, by by the time I was 16, I was a full-blown alcoholic and, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that I'm still here has given me an opportunity to see that as bad as things are, they have been worse. Right. There, we have got to remember, I believe, mm -hmm. the progress that's been made and use that as, um, transformational and formational information and experience right. and strength, hope, and, um, and, and wisdom, as we mm -hmm. might say in the rooms to figure out how to make more progress. Right. And right. to move ourselves forward in ways that do not repeat the mistakes of the past. Right. 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 Those being the very things you and I have been talking about, right. That mm -hmm. well, okay. It's, my my rights matter so much because they've been trampled so much that you know we can't that's not a good way to say this what i'm struggling to say is the mistakes of the past have been that consciously and or unconsciously sometimes consciously mm -hmm. we have done to others exactly what's been done to us right Right. in our attempt to free ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why this work of liberation, I still draw a lot on people like, you know, Ellie Wiesel and Audre Lorde and mm -hmm. Adrienne Rich and Judy Grahn and, you mm -hmm. know, those bell hooks, right? right. Bell yes. hooks talking about yes. love, love yes. as an ethic, ethic. Mm -hmm. and as and a, a, practice, a yes. verb. Mm -hmm. a, practice, a practice right yep well is the thing that keeps us from just cycling right right and, and, it's, also, and it's also that expansion is subconscious consciousness too because we were reading um uh, this uh semester i took race and cultural critique by professor lila sharif and mm. we read uh black looks uh race and representation by bell hooks and she was talking in two of the chapters about loving blackness as political resistance, theorizing blackness. And she was talking about decolonization using James Cone, yes. which is yes. a theologian that people, you know, know. So it's like, you know, these these topics are not siloed in, in, or the uh, the conversations, the discourse around it. People are talking about decolonizing faith. De uh, people are talking about how do we expand our consciousness as we continue to grow uh, as far as in that nature and knowledge of who we are, as well as also in nature and knowledge of who God is and what that means for our life, because that totally translates into different things for people. And that's cool, too. But it's it's an ongoing, continuous, infinite conversation, in my opinion. Yeah, and it's I think it is a dialogue, right? And mm -hmm. at its best, it can be transformative for all of us. Right. right? Yeah. And for me, I'm, I'm just fascinated by and curious about finding ways that in our praxis mm -hmm. and our language and our doing of love, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We can create expansion rather mm -hmm. than re restriction is right. what got us here. Right, right. Right, so how can I advocate for myself and my people in the way that advocates for others? Right. So right. to me is intersectional justice. And mm -hmm. you know, last night, Last night was the um, Yom HaShoah, right? Mm -hmm. The day of remembrance for the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It was marvelous. It was probably the, the most uplifting service <laughs> that we've had in a while around that, and at our temple anyway. And mm -hmm. our rabbi was talking about how we create resistance, right? The multiple ways we create resistance. And one of the things we did last night um, thanks to our cantorial soloist, Jason McKinney, who is pretty renowned performer and composer and um, just, just marvelous artist, but brought us songs in Yiddish and in Hebrew that were celebratory and also resistance songs, right? Mm -hmm. To remind us, I think, that 
one of the most powerful forms of resistance is to get about the business of being a person, mm -hmm. to survive, to mm -hmm. live, and to do so in a way that we transcend what's been done to us by not repeating it, okay. right? That we find ways to be willing to show up and keep showing up in a world that doesn't always know what to do with us and right. sometimes wants us gone, right? right? That we keep showing up and keep finding ways to make friends and to right. get out of the line at the grocery store and let the person with only two things in front of us or to, you know, to do the things that are that daily life is about in ways that, that keep us all hopeful and, and at our best. And in essence, that leads to the question of that's building community. So how do you right. Right, how do you do that? And how what ex examples or ways that you're doing that in your area? Well, you know, I realized several years ago that one of the things I do and have always done, because when I was growing up, I got the, what is that? Okay. What are you? You oh. know, and the, is that a, you know, is that a man mm -hmm. or a woman? Is that a boy or, I mean, my whole life. Okay. Right? Okay. There were scraps that I almost didn't survive, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But so one of the things I did that just became unconscious was I um, spoke first mm -hmm. to sort of avoid, I mean, practically I was doing it to avoid being misgendered or embarrassed or cause a fight or, you know, I would speak mm -hmm. first. Right. I smile at people, you know, then I got into a period where I hid, you know, mm -hmm. sunglasses all the time. And I mean, mm -hmm. and what I have learned, I, holding those two things in my, you know, those two experiences in myself is that the more that I can just show up mm -hmm. without extra protection, mm -hmm. with just a mindful awareness of, you know, what's going on with myself and, you know, if I'm in danger, taking care of that, but not projecting danger where it's not. The more mm -hmm. that I can just keep showing up. Right. The more I met with a willingness to meet me. Right, right. Not, not always. Not always, but most, most. But even having that disposition deflects some of the awfulness of an awful situation, right? Like right. It, it minimizes some of that. Yes. And so in my work, with others and um, in my community, what I try to do is prepare before. Mm -hmm. Like before I leave the house, I prepare even. Right. You know, like right. I'm not going to have trouble. I mean, you know, I have all this mm -hmm. stuff I do in my head. But when I'm doing intentional work, I prepare beforehand and I try to be, while taking care of myself, I try to be as present as I can. Right. I try to live my principles and own when I misstep. Mm -hmm. Like if I say or do something that's not one of my values, I try to immediately correct that. Right. Sometimes I suck at that, but I, I strive for it. Right. You sure get it. Get it. Get it. And I try to be appropriately vulnerable and transparent to model what I hope will show the kind of willingness I have to be in the world with other people going about the business of trying to be a person just right. like I am. Right? right. Now, having said that, I also know when I need to say, you know what, this is not productive for you or for me, we're going to end up doing harm and that's not what we want to do. We need to stop now. Right. Like I right. can still find a way I will do that when I need to. Right. But my experience has been that when I can model, mm -hmm and try to be the self I want people to know, mm -hmm. right? I'm, the me I want you to see. Right, right. It, I'm much more effective. And and how I came to know that was I was doing it, my old pastor when I was still, before I converted, and I were doing a training at a local Baptist church. Mm -hmm. and, um, he was doing it from the perspective, this was when I was, seeking ordination in the United Church of Christ. And he was doing it from the perspective of being a, a pastor in ministry with gender transcendent people. And my perspective was the tra gender transcendence education and my experience, right? 
we got done. I mean, it went really well, but it was rough at times. And we got mm -hmm. done, and um, Craig said to me, he said, you know, there were times when you had a parka on in there, and all you needed was a T-shirt. <laughs> so when I said to you at the beginning, this is my this is my uniform, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I'm here with the self I want you to know. Mm -hmm. And I'm not putting on a parka when I don't need it. Right. I love it. I love now, it. there are some days where I do that just out of default. And it's usually right. when I'm in really unfamiliar setting. I don't know where I am or I don't write like I don't have good footing. Right. And I feel threatened, mm -hmm. as we all do. Right. But right. when I'm capable of plugging in mm -hmm. and preparing, I try to be the self I want you to know. Mm hmm. This has been a great conversation. I could talk to you for hours. Uh, thank I you so much. I could talk with you for hours. <laughs> we need to, I would like it very much if we stay in touch. Sure, it's your thing. Last question of the night. What do you want people to get from your life? From my life? Mm-hmm. So on one level, I want people to, to, to know that Sometimes being whole or mm -hmm. seeking wholeness, seeking wellness means embracing our broke parts, right? Mm -hmm. and putting a little glue in there that maybe mm -hmm. they, I want people to be able to look at my life and see or know me, my life through me, see what my grandmother taught me when I was a kid. I talk about this in the book. Grandma told me mm -hmm. people are like geodes. Mm-hmm. You know what a geode is? Mm -mm. It's a rock that when you open it on the inside, you're all these crystal formations. On the outside, it just looks like a rock. A rock. Okay. <laughs> People are like geodes. You never know what they're made of and how beautiful they are until something breaks them open. Mm. And so what I would, you know, maybe amethyst, maybe garnet, maybe quartz, but there's stuff in there and each one's different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the world breaks us open and we can survive that. Right. And sometimes we have to intentionally break, yeah. open and we open. can survive that too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes beautiful things happen because of it. Right. That is so true. Well, I thank you. And I know our listeners are going to get a fantastic conversation. It has been wonderful so. to talk with you. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>